This is the Art and Business of Writing Podcast. Kate Erickson is a creator, engager, and implementer over at EO Fire, a seven-day-a-week podcast that interviews today's most inspiring and successful entrepreneurs. She's also the host of Kate's Take, the EO Fire audio blog, and author of The Fire Path, a beginner's guide to growing your online business. Kate is passionate about helping entrepreneurs create freedom in their business and life through developing systems and processes that can help their businesses scale and grow. Kate, welcome to the show. Chris, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. Great to have you. So um, can you expand a little bit on the bio? Kind of tell us your background, um, you know, in writing and entrepreneurship. For sure. Um, Well, my background in entrepreneurship is still quite young. I only became an entrepreneur uh, about three, four years ago. Um, So I have a very corporate background. You know, I did the whole college. Um, I actually decided to go get my graduate degree, which was really just kind of me extending my runway because I didn't really know what I wanted to do yet. Um, And when I was getting my graduate degree in English, because I really, really, really wanted to be an English professor, um, you know, I graduated, I tried to go after that job, it didn't work out for me. And I found myself at a bank working in a human resources department. Um, And I just got to the point where I'm like, man, I just know that there's so much more out there. I just don't feel like this is what I should be doing with my life. I go into work every single day, you know, kind of feeling down about myself. I go into work every single day, not feeling great about going to work. And I get home every day and I don't feel fulfilled. I don't feel like I've made a difference or an impact or any of that. And so um, in 2011, I finally took my first entrepreneurial leap, learned so many lessons. I tried to start my own business and about six months later, um, kind of threw it in the can and, and said, uh, let's start again. Uh, went back to corporate, actually, uh, to start earning some money because I had burned through my quote unquote runway during those six months that I wasn't able to make anything happen. And then I teamed up with my business partner and my life partner, John Lee Dumas, and we've been running EO Fire together for about three years now. Now, what was it like, you know, when you first took that leap? What were some of the concerns that you had or what were I guess, some of the things that you thought were going to happen that may not have happened? my concerns were anything and everything. Like Chris, I am such a planner and I am such an overthinker that when I first took that leap, oh man, I was so scared. I had no idea what to do. I, I honestly hadn't really set myself up very well for that leap. Um, financially I did because I purposefully stayed at my job and, and built out that runway. So I wasn't really financially concerned, but I didn't, I didn't know what running a business was about. I hadn't really done any research or, you know, consume content from those online who were doing what I wanted to be doing. I kind of just leapt and, uh, you know, started a website and I started going to mixers and meetups to try and meet people that, you know, I could potentially help serve. And it, it, sh- it never worked out for me because I didn't really know who I wanted to serve. Um, I thought I did at the time, but looking back now and all the lessons that I've learned over the past three years here at EO Fire, I realized that I I did not have a niche. I was trying to serve way too many people. And in doing so, um, I I wasn't clear on exactly what I could offer someone. So, you know, I was really nervous about, I do this. Is this going to work? And I think that a lot of that really messed, uh, really messed up my mindset Um, and I believe that it was a a big contributing factor to the reason my business didn't work. I really didn't have that confidence that you have to have as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, of course we're all going to be scared and we're all going to wonder, have that imposter syndrome. Like, can I do this? Does anyone care? But we've got to find ways to get past that. And I wasn't able to get past that. Now you wrote some good points in this statement you just made. Um, I want to go back to a couple of them. The first one you said you didn't know who you wanted to serve. How valuable is that now that you understand? And like, and what lessons can you pass on to people who are listening about taking the time to figure out who it is you want to serve before you make that leap? I mean, it, I can honestly say it's like the biggest game changer. I if I were to go back in time and start that business over again, knowing exactly who I was talking to, exactly who I was serving and what I had to offer them, I believe that I could have made it work. I 
definitely think that that is the reason why my business failed is because I did not know who I was talking to. So that kind of speaks to how important I think it is. And, you know, for anybody out there who feels like they're struggling with figuring out who exactly it is that they're talking to. And I don't just mean entrepreneurs. I don't just mean, um, you know, small business owners. I'm talking like I am speaking to entrepreneurs who have started their business in the past six months and are their goal is to create a product for their audience like that only scrapes the surface of like how intimately and closely you should know who you're speaking to and exactly where they're at right now because that's really what's going to help you create content and value that they're going to care about otherwise if you're just creating it and kind of hoping that people are attracted to it it's going to be really really difficult to grow an audience oh i i agree with you 100 percent on that um in michael gerber's book the E-myth. He talks about, mm. you know, the entrepreneur, the technician and the manager. And it seems like a lot of people who start businesses come out at that technician stage, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, and you talked about, you know, you had to consume content online. That was something you felt like you didn't do well. How important is it to find the right content to consume online? And where should we be looking for content that's relevant to entrepreneurship or even just digging into our own niches? Yeah, I mean, right there, I think it's important to understand, you know, what niche and, and industry you're in as a whole, because that's where you're going to know where to go and find the content that you need. Um, finding like online mentors, and I don't necessarily mean actually like going and hiring someone to be your mentor or your coach, but just having somebody who you virtually follow online, whether it be their blog, um, signing up for their email newsletter, these are all great ways to learn from people who are where you want to be. So if you have this vision for your business and you say, um, you know, let me use John as an example. When he was first starting out and he had the idea to start this podcast where he was going to interview entrepreneurs, he went online and he found people who were where he wanted to be with his podcast. These were people like David Seitman Garland of Rise, of Rise to the Top, people like Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income, people like Amy Porterfield. And so when you know where you want to be in your business, you can go online and start finding people who are already there and start following those people, start consuming the content that they have to share. Because um, especially in this niche, in this industry that we're in of podcasting and interviewing entrepreneurs and inspiring others to take their entrepreneurial leap, a lot of people who run these types of businesses are very open with sharing how they've done it. So it's, uh, you know, a, a very positive industry to be a part of. And it's also a place where it's easy to find content that you can consume that's going to help you along the way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, you talk about the imposter syndrome. Can you elaborate on that for people who are listening who may not know what that is? Yeah, the imposter syndrome. I mean, we've all got it, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, and it's essentially just the thought or the feeling of like, why me? Um, feeling literally feeling as if you're an imposter, like I don't have enough knowledge to be teaching other people this. I don't um, have enough experience. I don't have any experience. So what is it that I could share with people? Um, why are people going to want to listen to me? These are all thoughts and feelings triggered by the imposter syndrome and just kind of feeling as if you don't really have what it takes to make whatever happen that you want to make happen. And when you can put that to the side and understand that this is your mind playing tricks on you, that this is fear standing in your way of making an impact and creating what you want to create, because we all have experiences, we all have knowledge and we all have something to share. We just need to figure out what it is and we need to get out there and start sharing it. Oh, absolutely. I love that. Just figuring it out and getting out to sharing it. Because yeah, it's true. We all, everyone has something. Everyone has a passion that they can pass on. I mean, you hear it everywhere, every day, in forums, on Facebook, Twitter, wherever it may be. But I mean, finding that and figuring it out is so important. Which brings me to my next question about your book, The Fire Path. Um, you essentially created that. I started listening to The Fire Path when it was just on your audio blog. And then you compile it into a book, which made it even better because then I could sit down and read it and listen and outline my entire journey. Like, how important do you think it was for you to create that for people? And how effective do you think it's been in helping other people? I mean, the fire path is what I wish I would have had when I first started. And so my hope is that it's impacting a lot of people. I certainly hear from a lot of people who have read the book or listened to the podcast um, and heard that on the first 16 episodes. 
um, that it has been incredibly impactful just in um, giving them like a step by step, giving them a, an outline and kind of like a roadmap or a guide um, of what it's like to start your own business, of the things that you should be thinking about that you're probably not thinking about right now. Because a lot of the stuff that's online, a lot of the posts that you might see in forums or threads that people have started, um, you know, things that are getting picked up by Google, these are, you know, massively valuable posts, but they're talking about how to monetize and how to create products and um, kind of like this higher level stuff that when you're first creating your business, it's really not what you should be focusing on because you're missing laying the foundation for a strong business. You're missing laying a strong foundation so that you can start growing an audience because that's the most important thing. If you don't have anyone that you're speaking to, if you don't have an audience to offer products and services to, it's not going to matter whether or not you know how to create them if nobody's there. So um, what I what my goal is with the fire path, with a book that I created in the podcast, those episodes is to really help people understand how important that foundation is. You know, I talked about my first failed business venture. The first five chapters of the fire path are everything that I didn't do that I wish I would have known. It's just stuff I didn't even know about because I was brand new to this entrepreneurial world. And um, so hopefully, you know, a lot of people who are just getting started out who also may not know about, you know, how do I even find a business idea? How do I define my avatar? How do I know who my perfect customer is? How do I niche my business so that I'm sure that I'm speaking to a specific group of people? Um, these are all the things that, you know, I aim to share with people so that they can really get that strong foundation. Right. And that's the one thing I really appreciated uh, the most probably about the fire path um, was the whole idea of niching in. Because um, I know when a lot of people start businesses, you know, I started a business many years ago. It was a design studio and it worked it worked well for me. And so I just hit my wits in and kind of burned out with being a designer. But mm -hmm. um, the one thing is just we don't want to niche in because we're afraid of missing out, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, like, absolutely. Like, like, what would you say to someone who says, well, I don't want to niche in too deeply because I'm going to miss this over here. Or I'm going to miss that over there. Yeah. I mean, you've got to like understand that missing out on what's over here and over there is like that is a good thing. Because if you're trying to serve too many people, you're not going to be serving anyone. In trying to reach for five different groups of people, you're not going to resonate with any of them. I mean, put yourself in the consumer's shoes. Put yourself in the shoes of, you know, one of your audience members. And Chris, say that with your design studio, you are advertising that you can create um, you know, really great banners and that you know how to do Facebook ads and that you also do logo work and you have a really sweet email template that just like anybody would want to have. For me as a customer, if I go to your website and I see that you offer this many different things, what does that say to me? That says to me that this design studio doesn't really have a specialty, that they don't really have a focus, that one thing that they are just so good at, they're better than anybody else at it. That's the type of person that I want to work with. And would you agree, Chris, that that's the type of person that you want to work with too? Somebody who is an absolute master in their category? Absolutely. Now, let's let's talk about foundation, about, you know, you talked about the avatar and building, you know, kind of your presence. What do I start with? If I want to put the foundation of my business together, where do you suggest I begin? Well, I think it really begins with knowing who your perfect customer is. Um, so once you have a business idea and, you know, you figured out that this business idea, it pulls in your passions, it you have some experience or expertise in this area. Um, you've kind of proven it through finding that there are people out there talking about whatever it is that you're going to create. So you have a viable business idea. The next step is to find your perfect customer. Who is that one single individual that you're going to serve? And what what is it about them that you're going to be able to provide value to their life? Like, What's their biggest struggle? What's their pain point? What keeps them up at night? These are the things that you that are so important to know about your avatar because that's what's going to help you create content. A lot of people are like, okay, I have my business idea. I'm ready to start. Like, what do I do now? 
Do I write a blog? Do I start a podcast? Should I do webinars? Should I do videos? Should I be on Facebook? Should I be on Twitter? Um, you know, so many questions come up about what do I actually do now? And all of those questions can be answered by your avatar. That's why it's so important to find them and to know them because if your avatar is on um, the internet and they're searching for blogs to read and they don't like listening to audio and they're not really a video person, like they just like reading, then you know that you should start a blog. If your avatar is somebody who is very business focused and maybe you kind of have more of like a B2B business versus like a B2C, then you know maybe you're going to find that person on LinkedIn versus Twitter. And so once you know your avatar, you're going to be able to start making so many bigger decisions and how to move your business forward. So I would say at the very base level that once you have your business idea, identifying and defining your avatar and as a result of that, knowing what your niche is, because once you know exactly what your avatar wants and needs, you're going to be able to niche down to serve them and building relationships. Building relationships is so incredibly important in the beginning, you know, creating a sense of community for yourself so that you know you're not alone. Um, unfortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they're first starting out, maybe they don't have that support from their friends and family. Their friends and family are kind of like, wait a second, you're doing what? Like, get back to your job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it's really unfortunate because we need that support. We need to surround ourselves with like-minded people who understand what we're going through, who are on the same path as us. So um, building relationships is definitely another foundational thing for your business that I feel is really, really important. Well, that's key. Can you speak to that a little bit more like, okay, I'm starting a business, you know, of course, I'm taking this leap. People think I'm a little off for it. How do I find like-minded people? Where do I go to build these relationships? You know, a lot of it depends on your industry, your niche, um, where you're located, because there are a lot of opportunities that I think we don't really recognize, like right in our own backyard. You know, when they say, uh, um, you know, when you like get a new car or you start driving a car that you've never driven before, and then all of a sudden you start seeing those cars like everywhere. But before you didn't even know that they existed. It's kind of like the same <laughs> thing with like understanding what's going on in your community. Like, in San Diego, before I was an entrepreneur, I had no idea that there were meetups and stuff going on that were focused for entrepreneurs. Like these meetups are for entrepreneurs to get together and meet each other and talk about business and get feedback and brainstorm and all this cool stuff. I never knew that until I went out and I found it. So, you know, get on meetup.com and search in your area. You never know what's going on in your area until you go out and start and try and find it. Meetup.com is a really great place to do that. So you could go on there, search for your local area, and then put in a keyword. Like, are you, um, maybe your business is uh, about pet, uh, has something to do with pet owners. Um, there are like actually pet owner hangouts on meetup.com where you can like go and physically meet up with these people. So um, in-person meetups are great. If you're not in a location where you feel uh, or where you're not able to find a lot of that going on, um, go online. Online communities are an amazing place to connect with like-minded people. You could go into Facebook or LinkedIn or Google Plus, whatever your preference, and you can just type in the search, um, you know, pet owner group or, um, you know, maybe you're a designer, so you want to find other creatives or maybe you're an entrepreneur, so you want to find other entrepreneurs. Um, just type in the search in these uh, social media platforms and t there are groups there that you can join and become a part of. And that's where you can start meeting other people who are on the same page as you, who are doing the same things that you're doing and, you know, who can help support you. That's great. Yeah, I think, you know, just having support, it's vital in the beginning because it is, it's a, it's a hard thing to do to take that leap and to, to make those decisions. Real quick, so I, I listened to Michael Stelzner from Social Media Examiner. He was talking one day about how he started Social Media Examiner. He felt a little discouraged at first because he said that there were other people doing the same thing. But then he realized, well, I can look at it as saturation or I can look at it as proof of concept. Like, mm. what, like what are your thoughts on that? Like on the whole idea of kind of, you know, validating my business as proof of concept because there are lots of people doing it as opposed to is it saturated? Yeah, I love the it, that it's proof of concept. You know, all ships rise in a high tide. We need to start having a mindset of abu of abundance rather than a mindset of scarcity. And you know, 
going out there and seeing that other people are already doing what you're doing, you're going to do it in your own unique way. Yes, there are tons of other entrepreneurship podcasts out there. Yes, for me, there are a ton of people out there talking about creating systems and processes. But I know that I can bring a unique spin to it because nobody else is me. So even if I'm covering the same topic, I have my own unique way of going about it. And different people are going to resonate with that. People that might not resonate with somebody else talking about systems and processes might hear me talk about it and say, you know, I like Kate for this, this and this reason. Or they might do the opposite. They might not like me and they might like somebody else who's talking about it. But I would absolutely always look at it as that's proof of concept for you. Go out there and do it different and do it in your own unique way and you will attract an audience. I love that. You know, you said nobody else is me. Just that whole uniqueness. That's perfect. Mm. Now, let's talk about Kate's take a little bit. Um, so how did that come about? Like, how did you decide, okay, I'm going to do an audio blog as opposed to perhaps maybe like some of the other podcasts, which are more interview based? Well, I, I certainly kind of have always felt that I wouldn't be the best interviewer. Um, and not necessarily only that I didn't think I'd I'd be that great at it because, of course, with practice, you can become better. Um, it's just not something that I was really drawn to. And I was having trouble figuring out how I would make it unique to the point that we were just talking about. You know, you can certainly go out there and do something that other people are doing, but it has to be unique or else you're not going to stand out. You're just going to blend in with, you know, every other interview podcast out there. So I was having a difficult time understanding how I was going to make it unique. I knew that I could make my audio blog unique because this was going to be a podcast where I would uh, repurpose the content that I had published on the blog. You know, we were getting great feedback from the blog post that I was posting, but a lot of people weren't seeing them because they don't have time to go to our website and read a thousand word blog post. But they do have time to listen to it while they're on their drive to work or while they're, you know, out for a, a walk or while they're working out. They do have time then, but they don't have time to just sit down and be like on their computer. The beautiful thing about a podcast is that in order to listen to a podcast, you don't have to say no to what you're already doing to listen to that podcast. So being able to repurpose the content on a new medium to reach more people was really the main driver in creating the podcast. I wanted, I was spending so, so, so much time on this content, feeling really, really great about it. But then thinking like, man, I just feel like I could be reaching more people. And I knew that a podcast was going to be a great way to do that. So that's really what drove me to start the audio blog is, you know, getting this content um, into more people's hands. So let's talk about something you did mention. You talked about repurposing content because that's a huge thing for my audience of, you know, writers and people who are into the, you know, the author sphere. How do I repurpose my content? Like what are ways that I can do that so that my message, you know, goes beyond just my blog or maybe just my little social media area? How many different ways and different methods can I get it out there and make it different? Yeah, this topic is really exciting for me because it's something that I never really thought about before until I started repurposing my own content. And then I just thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I Because we work so, so hard on our content, whether it be a book or a blog or, or anything. And then, you know, there is always that kind of like, okay, I've hit publish and it's out there. Like, now what? And repurposing your content kind of gives your content a, a new life on a new platform and makes it available to people who are on that platform. Because, you know, to my point before, not everyone reads blogs, not everyone listens to podcasts. So if you can think about your content as, you know, the origination of your content, whether that be a blog post or an article or um, even a book, a PDF guide, a download of some sort, any of those things can be repurposed in a number of different ways. One thing that I see a lot of people doing that I absolutely love is taking their podcast and if they ask their guests the, the same question, maybe there's one question that they always ask every single guest, um, taking all those answers and putting them together in a guide and making it uh, available for your audience to download. 
That's an amazing way to repurpose your content. You've just taken the best bits of your podcast interviews and made it available in a PDF guide that you can now ask people for their email address in exchange for. So there you go. You're you're using content you already have. You're simply putting it together in a guide, which is convenience for people, because how cool is that, that they now get to download a guide and see what all of your guests said to one single question, giving them great insights. And, um, you know, you get an email address for it. You're building your email list. Other ways to do it, like if you take Kate's take in the fire path book as an example, I started writing the fire path as email responses to people's questions. And then I started thinking like, wow, I get this question a lot about avatars or wow, I get this question a lot about niches. And I started building that book from emails. So I was repurposing email responses turning it into a book. Once I wrote the book, I was like, well, you know, maybe not everyone's on Amazon searching for this book. Why not create blog posts out of this? So I took every single chapter and I made it a blog post. Then I took every single blog post and I made it a podcast episode. And so you can start to see like where you can repurpose your content in different areas to reach a wider audience, to reach a bigger group of people. Wow, that is amazing. (laughs) I love it. I love it so much. Uh, Just the ways that you can do that stuff that you just don't even think about doing with your content. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so powerful. You know, it makes like it makes you feel really good about your content. Um, Other people like sometimes people email me and they say, "I, I, I read your book or, you know, I opted in and I got your download or I listened to your podcast. And I'm like, man, how many more people am I being able to reach now that I've just repurposed my content? Like it is, it's so awesome. It is, and and you even created kind of a stress-free way of writing your book, basing it on emails and blog posts. I mean, that's, Mm. that is so easy. It is such a, not not that it's easy, but I mean, it's an easy way to pull in the content because people are asking you these questions. So it gives you fodder for being able to develop an entire book, which is, it takes a lot of the edge off of you trying to come up with everything out of your head or doing a additional research somewhere. So I think that's just a magnificent way of handling it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So (laughs) (laughs) now um, in your bio, you said something really, really interesting that I like a lot. You you talk about helping entrepreneurs create freedom. Like you didn't say you help entrepreneurs find money or create money, but you say freedom. How important is freedom first over financing a you know, just an awesome lifestyle or an awesome business. Like, how, There's an order there, which is obvious. Can you talk to that? Yeah. I mean, for me, freedom is different for everybody. And that's why I like using the word freedom, because what freedom is for me and my business and my life might be different what freedom is for you and your business and your life. And that word, I feel, encompasses why we are entrepreneurs. We are not entrepreneurs just so that we get to make our own schedule. We are not entrepreneurs just so that we get to share our message. Like we are entrepreneurs to create freedom for ourselves. We are entrepreneurs to create freedom for other people. In whatever we're sharing, we're trying to make an impact in somebody else's lives. And that impact might be bringing them freedom. And so whatever freedom is for you, that is what I like to help others create. For me, it is time freedom. It's being able to take a two week vacation in Europe completely unplugged from our business, but know that our business is still running. Um, Mm -hmm. It is financial freedom. It's freedom to spend time with my family whenever I want to, to not be tied to this nine to five job where, you know, I'm missing out on spending time with the people that I love and creating the experiences that are so important to me. And so in creating freedom, that really just encompasses everything for me. And through the systems and the processes that we've built in our business, that's what's helped us create this freedom. Yeah, and I'd love to talk about that now. You know, you talk about being able to unplug, go on vacation, you know, trek around the world. But in order for that to happen, you have to have a system and a process or several systems and processes in place. Can you talk about the importance of that? And then um, from there, expand on to ways to create them? Yeah, absolutely. So creating systems and processes are really what's going to help you scale your business. It's essentially finding the things that you do in your business that make the biggest impact for your business that actually help you move your business forward 
that you could be either automating, delegating, or batching to make most efficient. So once you're able to identify those things in your business and create a system or a process around it, which is simply a matter of maybe uh, the first step would be taking inventory. What is it that you work on in your business that moves your business forward? And you could do this by just having a sheet of paper by you for an entire week. Write down everything that you do for your business. When you take a look back at that sheet after that week is over, what are those repetitive things that you've been doing over and over again that you could create a system or a process around to help you do more efficiently? The second step would to be actually in, in order to create that system would be to take one of those things on your list. It's going to be one at a time. This is a, you know, over a several month process for you to create these systems and processes in your business is to write out the steps that you take. Like, what does it take for you to do whatever it is that you just chose from your inventory list? What's a step one to step done for you to get that finished? And then the final step in actually implementing a system or a process is figuring out which parts of those uh, of that uh, task, the steps can be automated, delegated, or batched to create the most efficiency and productivity in that task. And that's why I just, I love systems and processes because they help us be more productive, they help us work more efficiently, and they're what's going to help us scale and grow our business. Woo! Gosh, so <laughs> much goodness. <laughs> Gosh, this is so amazing. Now you talk about automating, delegating, and batching. How, how do I determine which of the tasks that I have to do during the course of my day should be automated, delegated, or batched? Uh, wow, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, let's, I guess maybe we can take one or two things that I do. Let's say, um, let's say I've got social media that needs to be done. Um, okay, so let's say that you take social media as an example of like a system or a process that you're going to, that you want to create a process around. So um, when you look at the steps that it takes for you to create a post for social media, let's say that you're going to first choose the platform then you're going to determine the frequency. Then you have to curate, you know, you have to find content that you're going to share on that platform. And or you might create the content yourself. Maybe you're sharing a blog post or a podcast episode. Then you have to actually schedule that content out. And then you, of course, want to follow up by engaging on whatever platform that is. So if we just take what I said as the steps that we wrote out, so we chose social media as the thing that we were going to create the system or process for, we just wrote out all the steps that it takes every single time we want to post something to social media. Now, if we take the third step and, um, and we think about how to automate, delegate, or batch parts of that, we might be able to automate the scheduling of our social media because we can use tools like Hootsuite or Meet Edgar, um, uh, any number of tools to actually automate that part of it. Scheduling it is not something that we have to do every single time. We can automate that part of the process. What about delegating parts of our process? Well, if we look at the curation and the creation of our content, that's actually something that we could delegate to somebody else. As long as we're able to train someone on the types of content that we want to share, we can have somebody else actually create our post for it, for us. So of the six steps that I listed, I think it was six steps in total, we've automated one of them. We just delegated two of them. And for batching, well, we could definitely batch our engagement on social media because we don't have to be on Facebook or Twitter like seven different times a day. We can batch that so that we're on Facebook and Twitter maybe 30 minutes of the day. And so in that 30 minute period, we're batching all of our engagement and we're going to get the maximum impact out of that engagement time versus being there five or six different times during the day. This is also going to help us be way more productive because we're not jumping in and out of these social media platforms throughout the day. So after, so after we go through those three steps, I mean, we've essentially taken care of that entire system or process. We've, we've either automated, delegated, or batched pretty much every step. Awesome. Kate, thank you so much for your time today. You shared a lot of great things. And best of luck as you continue on through your entrepreneurial journey with Kate's Take and EO Fire. Thank you so much, Chris. It was awesome chatting with you. I really appreciate you inviting me on. Absolutely. Take care. Wow. What an inspiring episode. 
If you weren't able to take notes, I've got you covered. Visit my website at www.chrisjonesinc.com forward slash podcast to get today's show notes as well as access other episodes you may have missed. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast on iTunes. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time.